Everyone on this planet, we all have to face. One common and persistent issue. Climate change. Nowadays, we can have information from the radars, from the satellite in the space. But that information needs to be verified. The satellite can tell you in this river, the water level is 10 meters high. But in reality, maybe it is 5. Because of all the noise around, because the, the satellite is too far from the, the ground and so on. So we have to have ground truth. Those are the stations on the ground that tell us, yes, here the water level is 5 meters. So we use that information to correct the satellite. My name is Paulan Kulbali. I'm currently a professor in civil engineering at McMaster University. It was very challenging when I got here. Very, very challenging. First, uh, starting with the language, as you may have noticed, my first language is not English. English is actually the fourth language for me. I, I grew up in Africa, I learned two African languages, uh, then I, sp I went to French school, so I learned to, 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 to do calculation, all those things from the primary school to the university, first in France, and then uh, I completed my PhD uh, at Laval, this is in Quebec. Uh, although I did the PhD, all the PhD was written in English because uh, of the topic, but uh, yeah. But uh, what is important to mention here really about uh, my first year at McMaster was uh, to make sure that when I show up in class, even if I have this strong, uh, what I call a strong, lovely accent, I always say that to the student, that you will get used to it. And uh, yeah, I make sure that it's not a barrier to my teaching that the students have all what they have on the screen. My, pre my presentation were very detailed and I make sure that really the students are satisfied with what they are getting. And that will work very well. I was more anxious about really the language barrier because I was uh, worried about my accent and so on. And I was totally surprised the first years how good my teaching evaluation were actually really good. The students were not caring that much about the accent. They were more caring about the fact that I'm passionate about what I'm teaching, that I'm always open, available to answer to their question, give them really exciting and good examples so that they understand. So that was what matters. That worked very, very well. And I will say it's basically because I put in a lot of work. For each one hour of lecture, I was spending close to three hours for preparing, one hour lecture, and to work out quite well. <laughs> the last couple of years, the COVID years really hit everybody out of the blues, right? And at the time, the good news that came out of COVID was the improvements in air quality in large metropolitan centers around the world. And that was like a, a beacon of hope in the midst of the darkness of COVID and everybody being locked down in their home, that when, when human activities brought to standstill, nature thrives. You know, we see, we've seen wildlife on the streets, we've seen you know, people who live in metropolitan centers who couldn't breathe clean air, all of a sudden now they see the true color of the, color of the skies. And I, in my neighborhood in Kitchener, so I started to track down um, the effect of the COVID um, lockdowns on uh, nitrogen dioxide levels, on particulate matter levels. Um, and I found that the students were really intrigued by that research and they volunteered their time for, for me to involve them in the data analysis. And then the, the government have launched special research funding programs for um, COVID-related research. And because air quality was linked to the COVID-19 lockdowns, I was successful in getting a couple major grants that helped me pay the students to do the data analysis and to actually launch a new outreach program that I did not have the time to do before COVID. We collected data about the levels of pollutants in the local air quality in Kitchener using these AQ mesh sensors. And with this data, we were able to run an outreach and education initiative. And we visited a lot of local elementary schools to talk to them about the pollution that is in their own neighborhood. And the goal of this project was really to try to get the students from a very young age to understand what is present in the air they breathe. And 
along with that we wanted to really implement specific interventions that can be done on a personal level but as well as on the level of the school board to improve not just the local air quality but also the health of the members of the community. Um, my experience with the project was quite amazing. Um, I got to learn delivery on how to speak to younger students to, un to also explain complex um, chemistry to them and like it's hard it's easier when you're talking to people on the same level but when you have to ex to break it down there's a certain level of understanding you have to get to to break it down to someone like who's in grade five or six you know they're like 10 11 12 years old so it helped me understand concepts properly and also explaining it more helped me even learn more My name is Hind Al Abadle. I am a professor of chemistry at Wilfrid Laurier University. I immigrated to Canada uh, in 2005 and started my academic career here. Um, and, I, and since then, I have opened an environmental physical chemistry lab where I recruit students um, to work on projects related to air quality, atmospheric chemistry, geochemistry, and environmental remediation. So, the air we breathe is fascinating for me. Um, when I was growing up, I had actually nasal allergies, and therefore the quality of the air um, in the environments where I will be studying, you know, learning or playing, um, came to acute awareness because I had some reaction to the pollutants in the air. Um, and then when I studied chemistry, I got to learn about the fact that chemicals contributed to all kinds of pollution. But also, when I studied chemistry, um, I learned that it's through chemistry we can actually solve environmental problems. So the science itself was fascinating. I, I like science, I, I like to know how things work, I like to know, when I know the air, everything um, around us, what, what is it made of? So that, that curiosity was there from a young age, and during school I really tried to capitalize on the knowledge and the books and from interacting with professors and teachers um, and that's how basically the whole interest was coupled with hardcore studies. Well, see, in the United Arab Emirates we had girls only schools and campuses in universities are girls only. So I did not face the, the issue of minority except when I immigrated to, the, to North America as a graduate student and then when I started my academic career. So my, my formative years were competing with other girls, being taught by other female teachers and mentors um, who actually told us that we have unlimited possibilities ahead of us if we couple our interest with hard work. Um, so the term minority is a term that was applied to me or it's a box that I felt people want to put me in only after I immigrated to North America. It was disheartening because, um, you know, when I, when I decided to come to North America, I, you know, I was coming to the land of the free and I was coming to the land of the liberty and fraternity and egalitarianity, right? And I thought, you know, all the issues that are coming around how I dress, how I present myself, how I decide to follow a certain religion or not, is not going to be an issue because I am in the land of the free. And so it was disheartening to, to actually see that uh, that's not the reality. Um, and therefore, it but then I always, always, when I think about these experiences, which I still face till this day, by the way, I've been in North America 24 years, um, it, I tell myself, why did I come here? You know, I, I had a choice. I was not forced, you know, uh, to come here. And it, it all still distills down to my passion for science. I really wanted to do science. I wanted to do it in the best places that do science and North America is among the top in the world. Um, I wanted to interact with like-minded people uh, who, um, you know, care about environmental issues, for example, and can take it not only from the lab, but also to, to the people, uh, to, the, um, to the policy makers. Um, and so when, it, when I remind myself um, of, of the why, um, I, I just, you know, this is where my resilience kicks in. This is where my groundedness in who I am and in my identity um, comes to, out to shine that I am here on a mission and I will do my best to be the best scientist I can be and to be in service of my community and the rest of um, the people I interact with in society. So it was a success story in the sense that the outreach program was 
that involved undergraduate students who were trained on delivering awareness materials to school kids to give them to get them in touch with with the own um, uh, environment they live in in this uh, regarding indoor air quality outdoor air quality how scientists measure air quality you know what are the chemicals and we did that from grade 5 all the way to grade 12 the undergraduate students had a blast um, learning about the process the school kids and the teachers and the principals appreciated that to no end and we had editors at scientific journals happy about this outreach and, and publishing about it um, so that was an, an, an amazing success story that I'd like to narrate because it really coupled what I just mentioned to you earlier, which is the fact that you, you, need, you need to learn the science, you need to talk to people about it, you need to train them about it, get them excited about this coupling between scientific knowledge and facts and the implications they have on their real lives. So, you know, the Industrial Revolution started with our ability to burn fossil fuels through the combustion engine, the internal combustion engine. And at the time, coal, dirty coal, was the main source of fossil fuels, and then we had oil and gas. Um, so the burning of coal at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution um, was just open. You, just, you know, you, you burn it and all these um, fumes come out with all these toxic gases and, and black particulate matter. And, and then that will just cloud uh, the air um, to the point that um, Western Europe experienced um, episodes of smog that actually killed thousands of people. Same in, in uh, Eastern United States and Western United States. And, um, and then the environmental acts started to come down and conventions started to be held to talk about what are we going to do. People are dying from the dirty air that's being uh, pumped because of we are burning fossil fuels. And then after that, um, uh, we started to see um, lakes being acidified. Um, large areas of forests um, will have no signatures of life because the trees have died and the grass have died. And it turns out that the gases that were emitted from burning fossil fuels have been converted to acids and the acids will come down as rain that has acidified uh, the lakes and the land and the soil and killed life. Because life prospers under basic um, conditions, not under acidic uh, conditions. Rain life-giving and nourishing. It's as important to all living things as the air we breathe. Yet it can also carry substances that may be potentially hazardous to the life and future of some of our forests. Those substances result in a phenomenon that scientists call acid deposition, more commonly known as acid rain. While rain itself is naturally acidic, acid rain is a pollutant. It is formed from oxides of sulfur and oxides of nitrogen. Released into the atmosphere, they are transformed with moisture into minute quantities of nitric and sulfuric acid. The main source of acid rain is the burning of fossil fuels, most commonly power plants that use coal to generate electricity. They emit sulfur and nitrogen compounds that produce levels of acidity 10 to 20 times over that of normal rainfall. That much is known, but the effect of acid rain is a matter of debate. Within the last decade, acid rain has become a controversial issue, fraught with doubt, uncertainty, and speculation, not only among the public, but among scientists themselves. While legislators and even nations debate the issues, there is still considerable disagreement among scientists about air pollution and its true effect on the forest environment. We need to be looking far enough down the road to realize that continuing to single out individual pollutants may not in the long run answer the questions the way we want. Our air, our air quality is a, is a system. There are many, many different chemicals interacting constantly. There is little debate that high concentrations of airborne pollution can weaken and even kill trees and other types of vegetation. In the past, this destruction has been limited to isolated local areas near the source of pollution. This is known as point source pollution. Fortunately, pollution control laws have significantly reduced this problem. 
But today, scientists are seeking answers about the possible effects of regional pollution. Pollution like acid rain that's generated in one area and dispersed to other areas. The question of localized pollution versus regional air pollution is related to a number of factors. Localized pollution normally relates to an identifiable source of the pollution, impacts from that source that are highly localized in a small area, and normally involves primary air pollutants, that is some pollutant emitted by the source like sulfur dioxide from the burning of coal, for example. Regional pollution covers a much broader scale, may come from a multitude of sources, and normally involves so-called secondary pollutants, which are not necessarily emitted by the sources, but are formed as a reaction product in the atmosphere from emissions. And then once the chemistry was understood um, and politicians became aware of it, this is when we had the Clean Air Acts that actually limit the, um, uh, the emissions of the, the gases that would have been oxidized to form the acid rain. And then the industries, uh, because of these political acts, um, now have to take responsibility and implement solutions in order for them to actually lower the emissions of these gases. And they turned out to chemistry. They, did, they turned to chemistry. So we had scrubbing technologies and in being invented. We had the catalytic converter invented. That was for the catalytic converter in the cars which actually take the gases uh, that are emitted from the internal combustion engine and converts them to less harmful gases. Um, for example, nitrogen oxides are, uh, are converted to nitrogen gas, right? And the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. And then when, for the sulfur oxides, using the scrubbing technologies, we were able to remove the sulfur dioxide and, uh, and create a material out of it that is used in dry walls. And you, so, during, so because of this innovation that happened um, at an industrial scale, we started to see the emissions of uh, these gases go down, and we started efforts to actually revive um, life in lakes and in land by, you know, adding uh, chemicals that will raise the pH um, so that life can be restored in these areas. Um, so this is a success story that actually show you, um, the, you know, the starting point, the political action, and also the um, industrial uh, innovation that happened to take care of it. My journey at the university uh, after the first two years where I really uh, worked very hard to establish my research. That was a challenge in part because uh, you have to establish your research program. So uh, the effort that I put in teaching and making sure that my teaching was really uh, appreciated by the student, I put the same effort in my research. So I first established what we call today the McMaster uh, Mesonet. That is uh, a network for meteorological station, which is a weather stations, and also uh, rain gauges, soil moisture props. We have more than 360 soil moisture props scattered across southern Ontario. Collecting data that are sent directly to the lab and we use that information to calibrate our hydrological models. Those are mathematical models that we use to represent the watershed, to model how the water run from the, uh, the, the street, the cities, uh, to the streams and then uh, later in the rivers and into the lake. This is what we call hydrology, surface water hydrology. It's so really how we model the processes that lead to the runoff into the, the lake and then uh, some water go up to the ocean. So we build mathematical model to represent that, the physical system, so that we can twist it. If you build a new Walmart here in this entire area, or we turn this entire area into a parking lot. What will be the impact on the runoff? Are we going to move the water in another place where we end up having flooding? Those type of tools, um, uh, the models that we are developing, or those tools that can be used to do those simulation before we actually do the, the work.
Yeah, being a, a black faculty and a real minority in the, the real term here, when you're one out of uh, 100, uh, put a lot of pressure on you. People are watching you. And uh, it was very important to show that uh, uh, I didn't get uh, to this position uh, randomly or by any really uh, through merit, through excellence that uh, uh, I got this position. So establishing the Mesonet was a one step uh, for me. And I did that, I will say, uh, with some support from some senior professors that I talked with uh, and went to lunch and tried to, to chat with them what are the areas where I think they think that I, I could have opportunity and support from the university because this network that I established, the research network, it costed uh, close to 800,000, uh, 800, so to close to $1 million is put into that system. So they needed some money from the university and from the Canadian uh, uh, Innovation Fund, the CFI, uh, the Canadian Fund for Innovation, and also the Ontario uh, Innovation Trust uh, put in money there. So there are three levels of uh, the university, the federal, and the provincial government level where I have to submit my application and then get the money to set up this research program. But uh, the help that I got from the senior faculty members at McMaster is to guide me to the system, how, how what I should focus on, what are the gaps, giving my expertise. If I go in this area, there's no one doing that. There's opportunity that you can make a, a difference and have the necessary uh, support. The, the research uh, that I'm really doing in my lab uh, getting the ground truth this is why we need meteorological station. Nowadays, we can have information from the radars, from the satellite in the space. But that information needs to be verified. The satellite can tell you in this river, the water level is 10 meters high. But in reality, maybe it is 5. Because of all the noise around, because the, the satellite is too far from the, the ground and so on. So we have to have ground truth. Those are the stations on the ground that tell us, yes, here the water level is five meters. So we use that information to correct the satellite. And then over time, we develop what we call algorithm. Algorithm or intelligent system, what you know, we call it artificial intelligence nowadays and so on. And those systems over time learn from the data set and then automatically can correct the radar measurement. They know that the satellite is making every time we have five meters, the satellite is C10. So there's a correction that is done automatically. So we build those systems, those algorithms to do those corrections so that we can harvest more data that cover larger uh, space area. So that one step in getting to the models that you are developing. Because those models also learn from the data set. And to get those data set in the model, they have to be corrected. Once that is done, one of the key research that we do is now how to use that information in a system that allow us to do flood forecasting. And the system that we develop jointly with other colleagues in, in Southern Ontario, I was really the lead on that project called FloodNet. FloodNet is a research program that brought together 12 universities more than 30 private and public partners were involved to develop what we call nowadays CAFUs, the Canadian Adaptive Flood Forecasting and Early Warning System, CAFUs, that we call it. It is a unique system in the country. We are still testing the system, and hopefully in the coming years, this system will be available in all the flood-prone areas across the country, for example, in Manitoba and in, maybe in BC, including here in, in, in southern Ontario and in Quebec, in the flood prone areas. That the objective of that system. We have made a progress on it. It's not totally operational yet. So working on it hard, doing the further testing required in order to, uh, to make it operational in the coming years.
So the flood forecasting system that we have been developing, that is really a unique contribution of my research group at McMaster University, uh, will be highly beneficial to Canadians. And even the people who are living in, uh, in uh, flood-prone areas, to the common people who take the transit every day. Because if there's an incoming flood, the main challenge is to how to get the information to the people quickly ahead. So the warning time, if you have you're able to warn people six hours ahead, for example, people can plan accordingly. People can close roads, for example, and we can take mitigation measures to make sure that we are not exposing uh, our children on the buses go, trying to go to school when the roads will be uh, flooded and so on. So it allow us to reduce the cost in terms of uh, losing people's uh, life, which is a tragedy, and uh, re mitigating also the economic loss and many other factors. Even take care of, our, of the farmers can better take care of the animals, move them to higher ground. There are many, many things that we can do to mitigate the impact of flood if we are able to forecast it at the right time, if we good lead time. That's really what is important. So this research has potential international benefit, actually. And we are actually planning to, to test the system when it is set up, running properly for the Canadian flood-prone areas, to test the same system, try to implement it overseas in Africa, in the Caribbean, in other areas where people can benefit from it. Because climate change, now it is well established, is contributing. Because in that normal, simple physics that I always mention to my students, collect the data set from the 1900s to 2000, or you can go up to 2000, 2010 or 2020, the data set available, plot it, and you can see the trend by yourself. And then what, that, what is doing, that heat in, in temperature, increasing temperature is doing, is simply increasing the evaporation. When you increase evaporation, the vapor, water vapor going into the atmosphere, there's cond cond condensation, that's the normal water cycle, and to come down as rain. So more you're sending water vapor in the atmosphere, more you will have that water coming into terms of intense rainfall. And this is what we are seeing now. In 2021, we saw what happened in BC, we saw what happened in Europe, for example, and even in the, in, in, in the, in the West Coast, in the US. We recently see what happened in California with the atmospheric rivers coming in. Those are very rare events in the past. Now, atmospheric river, we have seen them in BC with the flooding down the, the Fraser. We have seen them recently in California. Those build up because of high water vapor in the atmosphere. In the water sector in general, uh, climate change will create some opportunities because we need to adapt to climate change. So adaptation to climate change in the water sector is really a key because it has an impact on how we navigate our agricultural system. Agriculture rely on this. Managing our cities, the wastewater system from our cities. So all those systems have to adapt to the more intense and heavy rainfall that we'll be having, and also to what will happen to our lakes. Many cities are around the, in southern Ontario around the lakes. Let's say if the lakes water level are going up, for example, what do we do? And so on. So management issues. So there will be some opportunities on the adaptation side in the water sector. So there will be work for young people interested to contribute in developing tools that will help us to better adapt to climate change. And recently, actually, the federal government through uh, Environment Canada announced what they call the Adaptation Fund. I don't remember the total amount for money, but we are talking about millions of dollars for the Adaptation Fund. Because where we are heading now for climate change, we will have to adapt. Even if we were to shut everything down today, reduce the emission to almost, uh, I will say, 50%, what we are not able to do, realistically. So the only option on the table, if we are not foolish, 
is to start preparing to how will it adapt to the consequences for climate change. And the young people, they the one who have to come in, develop those tools in the water area. That is a really a transversal system. Water go horizontally in different sectors, actually. From the electricity that we rely on, for example, in Canada heavily, from the, from the, uh, the Maritimes to Quebec, and even in Ontario, where we have to, do have the nuclear, but around 25% of power in Ontario is still coming from hydro. In Quebec, it's close to 95%. And you go to the prairies and so on. So it is a really a busy something. So it's really important. Manitoba also heavily on hydro. So how we are going to manage those system and uh, the climate change impact is going to be a challenging uh, opportunity uh, for young people. Uh, I, I have been really interested not in science to start with. I was more interested in mathematics to start with because I, I don't know. And that's an important part here. Interest is what drives you to do things without feeling the effort that you are doing. And since I was a young kid, high school level, I was always uh, good in, in math. It was the easiest way for me to get good grades. So, and my father was a school teacher. So he always, uh, uh, yeah, tell me I have a small bike back then, which is already was a very good thing. I have a small bike. My older brothers, my cousin was using the bike. They were, yeah, grown up compared to, to, to me. And uh, every time the bike, the bike needs some repair. And my father will tell me when you have let's say 80 percent then i will repair the bike so i work hard to get the 80 percent he repaired the car the bike and then a few weeks later it is broken again in the next term i have to work harder to get the bike repaired and so on that was one thing but for me to get the 80 percent uh in 85 or he was pushing this up is really to do the maximum in math because i know that there the teacher cannot give me whatever mark he wants. If it is right, it is right. He will give me, even if it's 100%, I will get it. So that drives me into all what is math, physics, and thing where I can get the hard marks without, because in French, there was a French language. Back then, I was also learning Latin in the, at the school. All those things, it's a little bit fuzzy, you would never get 100%. If you are looking to push your grade hard, higher, higher, the only place you can do it is math, physics, chemistry. And that will slowly really push my focus on those subjects. For a black youth that really think that he's not good in mathematics and that science is too hard for him to go into, I will tell him up front that is not true. Because mathematics is the easiest thing that you can learn. It comes with practice. Like when you are learning to run a bike, biking, playing hockey, playing whatever game. Mathematics is through practice. If you practice hard enough, the same exercise, you do it, you do it, and you do it again, you will find the trick that is really easy. But if you don't, you, don't, you don't practice, you will not never discover the, the trick that make it easy, actually. But once you discover that, you will never go back. You will see that that is the easiest place where, through understanding only, I can have very good marks. So I think that thinking about yourself that you're not good at it, you're not, no, that's a mistake. And what I always say, including to my students nowadays, try, try, and try again before you give up. If you try and try and try again, and you see the result, you will, you, you will be surprised for yourself. Uh, I think that uh, black youth, uh, young girls, young boys, uh, to be successful, the first most important thing is the discipline. Playing is good. 
heavy your play date, your soccer, or your uh, hockey, or your whatever, but have a schedule in the week. So discipline is very important. My father was a simple, uh, he didn't go to university because there you didn't go, to, you need, back then you didn't need to go to university to be a school teacher. So he didn't go to university. But the discipline was very clear. Even during the weekend, I know from this time to this time I have to do my homework. When that is done, I can do whatever I want. So discipline is really what get you where you want to, to go. If you don't follow what you have planned to do, then you mix up everything. You have an assignment that is due. You have to work on it on Saturday morning, let's say, from 10 to noon. And you didn't do it. Then you move to somewhere else. So discipline is, and discipline is not something that is hard. People see it as something that is, yeah, uh, demanding. No, no, it's just planning. Everything have a place in the schedule. And then things will go smoothly. As you have a time to go for training for your soccer or to go to train for your basketball, same thing, you have time to do your assignment. You know that my plan this year is to do better in math. There are many books, many tutorials online that you can use. Every week, every weekend, I have two hours that I want to use. I will just go on to find a website where I can learn tricks, how to do exercise, how to... There are many material out there that you can use, actually, to do it on your own, to enhance your learning. And that's something you can do regularly every Saturday, one or two hours, and you will see a huge difference. What I know, what I remember about growing up is that I was competitive by nature. I was an athlete, a student athlete, and I remember even my teachers used to take me out to classes to practice and they would give me full marks just for practicing to be the, the top athlete in the school because we had competitions with other girls' schools. And I have medals from when I was a student athlete. Um, but then when, when, you know, when I started to get serious about studying, I, because that competitive nature continued to be with me. I wanted to be at the top of the class. You know, settling second wasn't even, didn't feel good. It was either the number one or, or number two didn't feel as good. So it is that drive, the internal drive to be the best, the best of the best in the class, um, whatever the subject is. So it was, you know, I excelled in the artistic um, uh, subjects, uh, the history, the geography, the linguistics, the religion. I excelled in all of that because I was competitive, uh, uh, you know. Um, so with the sciences, the same thing. In, in high school, we had to choose a scientific stream versus a literature stream. And the, the teachers will encourage all the top performing students to choose science. Society expected the top performing students to choose the scientific stream. Whether they are girls or boys, it doesn't matter. You are top performing student, you choose science. Um, and then I ended up choosing science and then I even excelled further, you know. And um, at the time when I was writing the comprehensive uh, high school exam, which was, uh, you know, a, a standard exam for the whole country, I ranked number nine. Um, you know, I fe it feels good that you rank number nine across the country from a standard test. Um, and I tell myself, look, I, you know, I did not he have a, a second number nine. I was the only number nine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and it, number nine feel felt good because it was across the nation, standard test. So, um, that's, this is how my education journey went well. Yes, yeah, so there are students who might be in a situation where they are also high-performing athletes and also um, studying or managing to study for their uh, disciplines or subjects that they are taking in school. And um, I was in that situation too in elementary and middle school. Um, you know, I trained for basketball. I was the captain of my basketball team. I, I played gymnastics and competed in gymnastics. I also um, competed in volleyball um, and in uh, track uh, races um, and all of that required time and commitment um, but at the same time 
you know, there were generous teachers who will, you know, give you bonus marks if you miss a class for training, but there was no excuse for actually missing tests all the time or not studying and pay attention during class. So, you know, uh, practice time, it's practice time. Um, studying time is a studying time. So this is when, it, when time management becomes important. Um, you know, having supportive parents at home helps, where they will bring in the food when you are studying, they will limit TV time. I mean, distractions are very important to bring under control. Students now have Chromebooks and phones and computers and access to the internet 24 hours. Big no. If you want to succeed as an athlete and as an academic student, you have to intentionally put limits on the distractions of the digital media. Um, you put your phone on silent when you are studying and when you are training. Life is not gonna end um, if you respond to your, you know, to your friends and you catch up with your friends on the weekends during a certain period of time. True friends will respect your boundaries, right? Um, same with uh, Chromebook and other digital media. Focused. The human mind thrives when you are doing one task at a time. Multitasking does not work. You cannot multi, you know, constantly uh, checking email and messages and YouTube and TikTok while you are studying for an exam. Your, your brain does not function. They weren't created for such a thing or they have not evolved for such a thing. You have to focus. Digital time needs to be limited during the day. I would suggest only access it for the minimum time during the weekend. Um, and studying and training should be your top priority. Once you get that under control, which is the digital media aspect, you will have a lot of time. There are 24 hours in a day, 24 hours. And we're only asked to sleep seven or eight hours of them. What are you doing in the rest of the time? Think. So time management, setting boundaries, and when you do that and you decide to do it, you'll find that true friends will stay and respect your time management and true boundaries. And those who, were, who will not, then, well, that's their loss, not your loss. Discipline really comes easy to a human being if they have a goal in life. And when you look at yourself and you are comfortable in your own skin and you work towards um, a mission in life, the, then you need to take um, action. You need to couple dreams and desires for accomplishments with action. You know, dreams come, say dreams, you know, but if you couple them with action and small steps and you set goals towards the bigger dream, you will see yourself that you are automatically adopting a lifestyle that is disciplined. Time management is one of them, setting boundaries is another, taking care of yourself mentally and physically will come easy to you because you are intentional in, your, in how you spend your time. Um, so, you know, I wish that you will have the supportive parents and the friends and the teachers who will encourage you on this journey. But let's say in the worst case scenario where you do not have any, you need to believe in yourself. You are on this earth, part of the community where you live in for a reason. And that reason will become clearer to you the more you work towards your dream, whatever that dream is. Um, so, so just take that time for self-knowledge, very important. You need to understand your value, what value system you need to adopt that will give you a sense of serenity and groundedness. And whether that's coming from a religious community or a religious teaching or from, or it's coming from the historical stories that you hear about your ethnic background, uh, or the accomplishments and, um, of your community and, and stories of resilience that keeps you going, whatever it is, as long as you see values in it, it gives you groundedness, it gives you a sense of identity that is strong, that no matter where the wind is coming from, you are as, you stand tall like a tree, um, not a leaf that just being thrown away in the face of the wind, then all of these things will come together for you. Um, feeling tired, take time to rest. Take time to relax. Um, you know, we are not the Energizer Bunny who works 24 hours seven. We are designed to work with our biology. You understand how your mind works, how your body works. Be in, um, be in the moment, but at the same time, do not lose sight of the big goal you set for your life. Mm -hmm.